One Tuesday morning, a developer sits down at their desk and they open up their laptop and they glance at some monitoring graphs and they're like, huh, is that a little blip? I can't quite tell. Could that possibly be related to the feature I deployed yesterday? Mm, so they open up a tab and they go to their log aggregator and they type in a query to maybe find some relevant entries and they hit start. And then they get up and they go to the kitchen for more coffee. That's it, that's the end of the story. <laughs> they never get back to that tab, it's gone, it's out of their heads. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Jessica Kerr, and <laughs> Jessatron on Twitter. And this talk, uh, it's got Ian Wilkes' name on it too, because it's his story. Um, but he's still in California, he didn't want to travel. So he is right now in the chat channel um, in the Strange Loop Slack, and also he's like watching us virtually. Uh, so go there and ask him questions. Uh, Ian is the database engineer um, on this project. He's been at Honeycomb for several years and he implemented the story that I'm telling today. Uh, I'm a developer advocate um, and I started at Honeycomb two months ago. So this is very exciting and new to me and I, I think it's great. I'm up here to tell you how we use AWS Lambda to do something very interesting and also how very interesting it is to use AWS Lambda. First of all, I want to tell you how we use it, but to tell you how we use Lambda, I have to tell you what we use it for. And that's our custom data store, which is called Retriever. Not this Retriever, that's Liz Fong Jones's cute dog. Um, but our custom data store is pretty interesting, so interesting that four years ago, right in this hotel at Strange Loop, Sam Stokes gave a talk about the data store itself. And I'll need to repeat part of that talk for you, except it'll only be about four minutes of it. But before I do that, I have to tell you what Retriever is for, why did we implement this custom data store? And that's because Honeycomb has very specific strengths and therefore specific needs. Now, four years ago at Strange Loop, one of our founders, Charity Majors, gave a talk about what makes Honeycomb so interesting. And two years ago, our other founder, Christine Yun, who's now the CEO, also talked about what Honeycomb can do. So I'll give you that information, but in five minutes. Okay, what is Honeycomb for? It's for observability, and by observability, I mean being able to find out what's going on in your system, in production, and to find surprises, to find things you didn't know what you were looking for. So it kind of turns monitoring on its head, because monitoring is like, okay, Tell me what you want to watch for, which of course is everything that's burned you in the past. Every graph in your dashboard is scar tissue. Um, but monitoring is really good at counting all that stuff up so that the graphs are fast. Honeycomb says, okay, tell me what you want to look at right now. And I'll make all of it fast. You don't have to know ahead of time what you're gonna to need to count or aggregate, and you're also gonna be able to get to the raw data. Let me show you what that's like. So, okay, the other day, I sat down uh, to find out how long our lambdas run. I was like, okay, how long does a lambda invocation take at Honeycomb? And so, is it gonna play? Yeah, yeah. So I was like, okay, I gotta find the right spans. To do that, let's see, I, I'm gonna count something. I know the service name is lambda for these guys, um, yep, there's some. Now, what is the name of the span that I need? I'll have it grouped by name, and then it's gonna, it's gonna show me all the names. And so I'll scroll down to the list, and aha, invoke, that's the one. I want all the invokes, show me only those. Okay, yep, there they are, just the invocations. Now that I have them, I can say, okay, what's their median runtime? So I got the P50 of the duration, and I can get a graph of that. Okay, well I look at it, I'm like, why? Why is this so spiky? It's like sometimes they're half a second, sometimes they're a second and a half. I'm gonna like try to investigate a little further and find out why that is. So I zoom into this 
extra spiky section. And I'm like, huh, uh, I would like to like, ask what's different about these really long ones. So first I'll get a heat map. The heat map shows like all of the traces and how slow they were at the same time. Uh, but more importantly, it lets me click on bubble up and then I can like draw a box around the area that's like got an extra high median uh, response time and say, what's different about these? And we run some like super basic statistical analysis. This is not AI unless you really need us to sell you that, in which case I'll, it's still not AI. Um, so it's just saying, okay, look, this section has a lot of this one trace ID. And I'm like, that's interesting. Okay, I wanna find out about that trace ID. So that represents one particular query coming in from our web interface, from the product. Uh, and I know I can get the, the query spec uh, because we have like all the raw event data available. I'm like, okay, which span in this trace would have the query spec on it? So I'll look where query spec exists. And um, it's like, okay, well, there's these and retriever client fetch. Yeah, retriever client fetch, that looks good. That's like the top level of the query. So as it comes in uh, to the database. So I'll get just that one and then I'll go look at the raw data. Now I can see everything that came in. Oh, there's the query spec. Uh, yeah, that looks hard. Sure. I mean, <laughs> I'm still new, so I don't know how to read that yet. Uh, but it's plenty for me to say, hey, Ian, <laughs> what's going on with this? <laughs> and, and also, I can like send in the links, or I can post it in Slack to all of these queries that I ran uh, so that he can see what I was looking at and we can talk about it. So Honeycomb is letting me ask these questions and a different question and then a different question. And also it helps us talk about them and spread knowledge throughout the engineering team. Overall, Honeycomb enables rapid fire interactive debugging of what the heck is going on in production. And interactive is important there. Because if I have to go get another cup of coffee, that is not interactive. I can take a sip of my coffee. I'm okay if I have to like take a sip and then it's there. That's, that's just peaceful. Um, but going to get a cup of coffee is not okay. So we need a, our data store to respond very quickly to any query over any field and any combination of fields. No indexing no pre-aggregation, we only store the raw data and we do all the plussing and the other monoids uh, at runtime after you send us the query. Okay, how does Retriever do that? Well, at a very high level, there's some events that come in from your applications or your CI systems and Retriever stores them all. And then later, you, the developer, uh, interact with the UI and send queries and Retriever sends you the results and then you send more queries and blah, blah, blah. Okay, but that's very high level. Zooming in a little bit on the Retriever part, uh, events come in on Kafka, Kafka partitions them. On each partition, there's a Retriever, actually two Retrievers, we run them in pairs for redundancy. Um, and so the, the Retriever reads all of the events coming in on Kafka and stores them in local disk. And then when the query comes in, it comes into one retriever. That retriever uh, fans out the query to all the retrievers that have data on their local disk for this particular data set. And they all access their local disk, add a bunch of stuff up, send it back to the original retriever who um, consolidates those monoids and sends the total results back to the UI. Cool, we use NVMe local disk, which is not too expensive and very fast. Um, SSDs are just fast these days, it's pretty sweet. Right, so that's fine. And then, oh, so that's trick number one, distributed data store. Trick number two is distributed column store. Uh, Sam talked a lot about this. So we're not just dumping those events in one file on local disk. We're more clever about it than that. Uh, we divide them up into a column and to every, every field in the event is a column. Everything has a timestamp, but other than that, it could be anything or nothing. There's no predefined schemas here. 
Uh, so we put each column in a separate field. We add an arbitrary ID so that we can hook the different records together. And events tend to be sparse in Honeycomb because um, your CI tests might have a bunch of fields about testing and um, something else will have completely different fields and you can add new fields at any time. So these, uh, the column store means these files don't all have to be the same length. We can save space and more importantly save reads that way. So the file per column helps us a lot, especially because when the query comes in, we only read the files for the columns in the query. So we'll always read the timestamp file, uh, but then we'll read whatever columns you filtered on and whatever columns you want to add up, but that's it. Uh, when you do go ask for the raw data for the, like, the full span, then we'll access every one, but that's fine, that's smaller. Um, right, so column store, that's trick number two. Trick number three is we can't let these files grow, to, grow forever, we have to segment them somehow. We segment them, uh, well we segment them as they come in. At some point we're just like, oh, that segment's done. So they're really segmented by arrival, uh, but we store uh, timestamp. So I lied about no indexes. There's really exactly one index. It's the timestamp. Because on all of these graphs that we're showing, the x-axis is timestamp. Every query comes with a time range. Uh, this is the one thing we do index on. Um, so every million rows or 12 hours or gigabyte, uh, we, we chop that segment off, store in the database what its timestamp range is, and start with the next one. Now, uh, these are, uh, Kafka guarantees that the events are in the order that they were given to Kafka, but different applications in your infrastructure might be sending events at different rates. So they're not like perfectly um, disjoint on timestamp, but that's okay. They, they overlap. We know which segments overlap. It's fine. So in the end, we wind up with each retriever has a but per data set, uh, which is kind of like a table. Um, it has a bunch of segments, and it knows what timestamps each of those are. And that means when the query comes in, Retriever knows which segments it has to read. And it has to read the entire segment, uh, but only for the ones that contains anything in that time range. This is fine. So that's great. This, this works. This is the, the state of Retriever as of Sam's talk four years ago. It does dynamic aggregation of any fields, across any time range, and, um, and it's fast. Now, it's carefully suited to our problem, and it's continually optimized. Ian and the other people on his team are always, always making it faster. And then we give it more to do, and then they make it faster, and then we give it more to do. For instance, <laughs> at some point, um, we get bigger customers, and bigger customers have higher volume of event data. And as of four years ago, we were selling like gigabytes. How much of your data will we store on these local disks at a time? And, and the, the customers are like, gigabytes? The, try, try terabytes. Let's start there. Um, and so this, these local disks start to look pretty small. And there's, there's only so big a disk you can get on one EC2 instance. And, if you start adding EC2 instances, that has other problems and is complicated and expensive. So, all right, local disk is too small because as these events come in, I mean, we've, we've got a, a limit of how much data we'll keep for each customer. So as soon as, as soon as they fill that up, we start deleting the oldest stuff. So now we've got these segments filling up however many gigabytes. Um, and, you know, we've got 10 minutes of data and then we're throwing it away. That's, that's not enough. 10 minutes is not enough. Okay, so we need clearly more data. And when you have more data, what do you do? You put it in S3, of course, which holds all the data in the world and more than you have ever created. Okay, so yeah, we're like S3 is the whole world. We'll just supplement our local disk with S3. Okay, so now each retriever is responsible for, instead of just deleting the data as it runs out of space, moving it to S3. And so now we can keep all of the data for 60 days. And on query, the retriever um, for each, each of the segments that it's in charge of, it still knows which timestamps go to which segments, and so it'll go retrieve what it needs and add it all up. And now customers can run queries over 60 days worth of data. Oh no, 
They're running queries over 60 days worth of data. That's so much data. <laughs> and our, our poor retrievers are like, they're adding and adding and adding and adding. And here's the thing to know about uh, the, this particular problem um, for us in our circumstances, the limiting factor here is not I.O., it's not network, it's CPU. Because as we're reading each file, each record in each file, we're making a decision. Like if it's a filter column, it's like keep it, skip it, keep it, skip it, keep it, skip it. Or if it's, a, if it's one of the aggregation columns, we're like, okay, build the Q digest for the P50 or whatever it is. Um, so we're constantly aggregating and deciding, and it's compute that limits how fast we can read the data. So we wind up being CPU bound, which means however much, and we've only got like eight CPUs per retriever, that's what we're stuck with. So however much data we have to read, however wide that time frame is, that's how much longer the query's gonna be. So you get like this linear, roughly, extension in response time with respect to how long you're querying over and how big your data set is. And that's not cool, because we're way past SIP range now. You go get a cup and you come back. We had to extend our query timeout to an hour. That's like roast the beans and grind them and make yourself a very fresh pot. This is not interactive. Okay, so that's not, okay, we need this line to be very sublinear. Uh, we need response time um, to, you know, uh, some queries are just harder than others and bigger than others. And if, if the extreme ones take a minute, we're gonna live. Not four minutes, but a few of them will take one, but that is the outside. So instead of scaling our response time with the amount of data we're reading, we wanna scale our compute. Uh, and we need to scale that compute really fast because, again, we want to respond within a minute. Uh, so, I mean, normally when you want to scale over scale compute, you start up more EC2 instances. Well, right now, starting up an EC2 instance takes us like five minutes. Ask me again in a few weeks when we're on Kubernetes, it might be different, but it's not going to be less than 30 seconds. That's not going to get us to those SIP level response times that we're aiming for. So starting up new instances is right out. I mean, we could keep instances running, but we're not made of money. That, it's ridiculous. The queries that come in for us, uh, here's a frequency. Um, this, is a, this is the count of Lambda invocations over 24 hours. So you can see how high and thin these peaks are. If we ran enough EC2 instances to have the CPU for this peak, we'd be running thousands and doing nothing with them. 99% of the day. Uh, so that's ridiculously expensive, that's out. So we need more compute and we need it fast. All right, so, whoops, that was backwards. Okay, so Lambda. Our retrievers have written in Go, so we spun out this little Go function and put it in the cloud, and now each retriever, it knows how many segments in S3 that it's responsible for aggregating. So it spins up a lambda per eight, or in this picture, four of them, and says, you do it. And the lambda being, I mean, practically next door to S3, um, reads those files and does that aggregation and ships it back to its retriever, which ships it back to the retriever that got the query, which ships it back to the UI aggregating, aggregating, aggregating really fast. Uh, this works. So each retriever now, instead of being responsible for thousands of segments, is responsible for thousands divided by eight of lambdas to aggregate. And it worked. Here's a very rough graph of a couple samples of our average query time based on the number of segments it's retrieving from S3. And the important part, it is sublinear. We are scaling compute instead of response time. So this is what we use Lambda for. We use it for on-demand compute, and we think that's pretty cool. Uh, it's, it's working for us. We observe a 50 millisecond medi median startup time. Now, sometimes that's faster. If it's a hot start, it might be 10 milliseconds. If it's a cold start, it might be 300. It's fine. It's well within a sip. We're, it's fine. 
Um, ours take about 1 sec 1.5 seconds at the 90th percentile, but of course, that's not an AWS stat. That's entirely what we do in our lambdas. That's, that's our function. Uh, but the last stat here is very much an AWS stat. This is calculated based on sticker prices. Um, Lambda is about three to four times as expensive as EC2, measured in CPU second. Um, so, so we're paying for compute, that's our limitation, that's the price comparison we're making. And three to four times as expensive might sound like a lot until you realize we're running it like a hundredth of the time and we're only paying what we're using. So that's a win. Of course, there's caveats around all of these. So let's talk about some of the things that we've learned um, at, in this process of using Lambda in our database. And like, if you're thinking, wow, this is cool, I bet I could do this too. Well, here's some stuff to think about. Um, Lambda scales, okay. Lambda scales very quickly until it stops. <laughs> so as with everything in AWS, there's a limit. This one's called the burst concurrency limit. And uh, you start up Lambdas, you start up Lambdas, you get to, in some regions in 3,000, in some regions it's 1,000, you get to this limit and you start getting HTTP 429 rate limited. Dang it. Okay, now here's the thing. We're using this as burst compute. AWS doesn't sell it that way, you know? They sell it as like, here's your magic website backend that you didn't have to start a server. I don't mind starting servers. I just want more computers, please. Uh, yeah, so, so their mechanism for increasing this burst concurrency limit is that if you have sustained load, if you're running a sale on your retail site and people are slamming it, then after a minute of sustained load, it'll be like, oh, I will boost your concurrency limit by 500. And now you have 3,500 lambdas. I, and then another minute, and it'll give you another 500, up to some top limit after which it stops. And above that is all 429 land. This doesn't help us, because our load looks like this. This is completely irrelevant. Now, AWS, if you send them a support ticket, is very happy to bump your top level concurrency limit. I don't care. I need them to bump this one. Um, yeah, so that, that's a limitation. What can we do about this? Uh, we could run more CPUs per Lambda. That'll help us, uh, since it's per Lambda invocation. What AWS wants us to do is to pay them for uh, provisioned Lambdas so that they're running all the time and we just pay less for the CPU that we're not getting. <laughs> that doesn't help. The whole point is we need these about like one one hundredth of the time and we don't know we need them until we need them. We don't know we need them until that query comes in. So no, we're not running provisioned Lambdas. Um, at some point when we, when we hit the limit, uh, they just have to wait. And, and, and they have to wait, meaning whenever you get a 429, you need to retry. And here's another thing that we ran. Well, we, we noticed eventually that the um, SDK for Go, the default timeout is like a minute. This is not helpful. So no, we need to retry more aggressively than that. Um, we discovered this and we learned about all these details, of course, using Honeycomb as we do. Um, and this used to be harder, but right now it's, it's easy because we have this concurrency operator, so it's now trivial to say, hey, how many Lambda invocation spans are running right now? And it gives me this nice graph, or, or we're running at any given, what's the granularity there? Minute over the last 24 hours. Uh, this concurrency operator was released to the public last Thursday so that I could mention it to you today, and now you can use it, yay. Yeah, so Lambda scales within limits. The lessons here are everything in AWS has a limit. Study them. Read this page that's, that's linked very carefully. Uh, don't use the default retry parameters. Always define your timeouts and your retries and define them for your use case, not whatever the heck somebody hard-coded. And observability helps. Next, uh, median, or the, yeah, the median start time. So of course the startup time is not always 50 milliseconds. It might be 10 for hot and 300 for cold. 
Um, oh, here's a cool thing. I think this is fun. So the, there's the lambda invocations, which is when we call the functions and it does stuff, but there's also the lambda instances that those, those invocations execute in, and we can trace those too. So I just think this is fun to look at a trace of a lambda instance. At the top, there's one little main, which is 10 milliseconds, which is a slow one. They're mostly microseconds. But then it's like run, sleep, run, sleep, run, sleep, run, sleep. And all the, all the wider spans here, the long ones, are sleeps. Now, here's the thing about those lambda sleeps. This is not a restful sleep from which it wakes up refreshed. <laughs> as soon as that lambda returns its data, it's like, here, I, I got a return for you. And it's just stuck, and it's completely frozen, and it is not garbage collecting, and it is not doing the cleanup you wish it could do after it responds to that request. When the next request comes in, OK, then it can do its cleanup. So, so that like hot start time, yeah, it, it still might be recovering from the previous request. Uh, that CPU time you're not paying for, <laughs> you're not getting any of it. Uh, so, so that's a consideration. The, the sleeps are more like carbon freeze. Um, and I think this is cool. So like that you can compare the concurrency of the invocations to the instances. So AWS is uh, running running slash sleeping um, a lot more of our Lambda functions than it's actively using. You can see the width of that graph there. I just think that's a cool graph. All right, Lambda scales up our compute. Oh, and 90% of them return within 1.5 seconds. Uh, and that's the 1.5 seconds is ours, but there's some things to know about Lambda's returning. Uh, first of all, we noticed that while we can get like a P90 of 1.5 seconds, if I look at the heat map of all the lambdas returning, there's like, there's like this, oh, there it is, right along here, oh, I can't do that straight. Um, this is like the 30 second line, and there's a lot of traces that um, took 30 seconds, right at 30 seconds, which turns out to be the S3 timeout. So when you're talking to S3, it's like 99.9% .9 successful, which is squat when you're running tens of thousands of them. So failure is totally normal. Retries are totally normal. Again, change your parameters, because it turns out the Go SDK by default will retry for five minutes. No, we don't care. Let it go, SDK. So you got you to gotta watch that. Um, the other uh, limitation on them returning is that when they return, they can return six megabytes. This is a heat map of our returns, and the font's really small, but trust me, sometimes we return 200 megabytes of aggregated data. Because if you group by a bunch of fields, you're going to return a whole bunch of groups, and that's a lot of aggregates, and it might be 200 megabytes from a single invocation. Uh, so yeah, put that in S3 and send a link. Um, we love S3. S3 holds everything. Oh, but another thing we did learn was um, when you put it in S3, yes, compress it. No, don't gzip it. Because gzip is an ancient compression algorithm that is not the best for anything. It's like fatter and slower than modern compression algorithms. So if you control both ends of that compression and decompression, please choose a more modern one. That gave us a big speed up when we figured that out. Also, on the way in to your lambdas, you've got, there's some limit to, how, to the size, of course, uh, but we didn't notice that. What we did notice is this is a web backend, right? So you got to send it JSON. And there's like some AWS JSON cop that's watching the requests go toward the lambda and being like, no, you don't look like JSON. Rejected. Uh, Carly braces. Okay. I, we don't know exactly like what qualifies as JSON to this cop because JSON's kind of a, it's a little fuzzy. It's not like checking the number formats or anything. But speaking of number formats, JSON, just no, no. <laughs> you know, <laughs> store the data in S3 in a format you control and send a link when you're using Lambda for compute. So a lot of the same things. Again, study your limits, change the retry parameters. You need observability for this because it, 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 it's so opaque. 
Lambda is so opaque compared to running on your own server. I mean, what is serverless? It means you don't have to care about the server. It means you don't get to know anything about the server. And you have to like not control the server. Um, earlier today, uh, Patrick Flores said that works on my machine doesn't cut it anymore in distributed systems. There is one runtime. It is one global runtime, and that is it. And that's terrifying. But with Lambda, it's really true. And so observability makes a big difference here in figuring out what the heck is going on. Uh, finally, cost. Of course, cost is a consideration, because um, the positive is you're not paying for it when you're not using it. But the negative is, well, what if you suddenly use it? And how much of it do you use? Um, in Honeycomb, we have a trigger that lets us know if any single customer has just cost us more than $300 a day in Lambda alone. And when that happens, we go look at the queries that were run, and we go find that person who wrote a script that imitates the browser to repeat a 60-day query every minute or two. <laughs> and then we talk to them. Um, because, because um, we, I mean, something like this, we have to react to how our customers use it. And sometimes that's helping them use it. Sometimes that's like uh, um, caching things for the, for the API, not for the browser, not for, not for the interactive human part, but for the API. Um, we, we have to react to that. All right, so functions have a mysterious amount of cost. Again, you have to have your own ways of monitoring that. Um, oh, oh, but speaking of cost, maybe they just got cheaper. So last Wednesday, three days ago, AWS released Lambda on Graviton 2, which is like an ARM processor instead of AMD. And they say it's like, they say it's 19% faster, faster is cheaper, and 20% lower cost, which is also cheaper. Um, so if, if this is true, then we're gonna get a big boost. We already run Retriever on Graviton2 and EC2, so this should work fine. All right, so we already did an experiment. Um, we, we put in a feature flag and we started shipping half of our Lambda invocations to Graviton2 and half to the usual AMD processors. Uh, the results are, uh, well, the results, um, these graphs are saying that the, the P50, the median is about 20% slower on the Graviton2, and the P99 is like twice as slow. Um, so 20% slower, 20% cheaper, that evens out. So it's costing us the same amount, um, except that the extremes are worse. The, the slow cases are extra slow. So that's not a win. So last night we flipped the feature flag and launched Darkly to say, okay, 99.1. We'll keep a few running on ARM to continue the experiment, but most of our customers are going to get the slightly more predictable response time from AMD. Uh, so, so that's Lambda is also constantly improving. This is good. Final summary slide. Again, the limits, know them, deal with them, and the retry parameters fix them. We haven't talked about deployment. Uh, well, use versions and make sure you have feature flags so you can roll it back really fast when you observe a problem in production. It's not trivial. And then there's testing. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't work on your box. We, we stub out the lambdas for, for our own internal testing, and then we see what happens in production. <laughs> so yeah, observability is a big deal in this, in this particular space. But the good news is this works. Uh, we, we are succeeding. We are succeeding so well at scaling up our compute that we're starting to find network constraints. And like the aggregating retrievers are like, they're becoming the bottleneck and, and how much they can read. So this is good news uh, because optimization is all about finding new bottlenecks as fast as we can. And all of this is in the name of preserving our one most precious resource which is developer attention. So thank you all for your attention now. And, oh gosh, I have, oh yeah, I have five minutes for questions. 
um, in the room, but uh, Ian is in Slack, which I don't have the Slack up because I wisely did not connect my computer to the internet. Um, and uh, yeah, find us on Slack. Oh, oh, next slide, Jess. Honeycomb.io, we have a blog with a lot of the stuff about how we've made Retriever faster over the years. You cannot find Ian on Twitter because he exists in real life only. That's how he gets so much done. <laughs> but you can follow me on Twitter and uh, Liz Fong Jones, who's our other developer advocate and has a pretty dog. Thank you. <laughs>